Everybody, we'll get started in just a minute. Nice to be with you all tonight. <clears throat> I'm in a new setting. I'll just show you. Maybe some of you will recognize looking out this back window here. I'm at Common Ground Meditation Center's retreat property. We sometimes casually refer to as Prairie Farm. And uh, we're just finishing up almost two weeks of work retreat. We have a wonderful group of <clears throat> community members who've been working hard and living harmoniously with each other these last few days, getting hot, probably like all of you, wherever you might be. But it's, uh, I always consider it a, a bit of a minor miracle that we get to come together on a Friday night and cultivate loving kindness practice together. That's really an unusual event in human life. And um, as you take care of your body, it's good to remember the real essence of loving kindness practice, metta, and all of its flavors of compassion and appreciative joy and equanimity is really about realizing that we're not trapped with our attitudes and intentions of aversion. I mean, obviously we have a lot of emotional and psychological patterns that are fear-based, <clears throat> that are about aversion or irritation or boredom or anger resentment, but that it's possible for us to find in our heart another intention, not an aversive intention, but a, a generous intention, a wishing well for ourselves, a wishing well for others. So one of the things that really helps is to feel comfortable, <laughs> like just turning that corner from our mind being kind of gravitating, maybe even being obsessed with intentions of irritation and aversion and fear to realizing my heart can wish well, my heart can care, my heart can be generous. What really helps, you know how this is, it's, it's so obvious when we pay attention that when we're feeling good, it's really easy to be kind and compassionate. And when we're hurting, it's harder. <laughs> So in a little way, just taking some time now to really take care of your body so you're sitting comfortably and you have, to whatever degree is possible, some ease in the body, because it helps. And of course, the more we understand how to find this quality of love, the, the less dependent our practice will be on physical comfort. But, uh, you know, if we can use the uh, physical comfort, it really helps to develop some momentum in the practice. Like we belong in the body, sinking in. And, you know, part of it is, of course, adjusting the posture so it feels better. But part of it is the heart or the mind making peace with the limitations of this body. You know, whatever age your body is, whatever particular wounds or weaknesses or injuries that it might have, illnesses that it might have, just scanning through, grounding into and making peace with. Maybe it's okay enough to relax, embody this experience of the body. And that act, that's in a way the first act of kindness is this grounding in the body, this acknowledging that the body is like this. That's a generous thing for us to do, isn't it? To be, in a sense, we're generously saying yes 
Yes, the body's like this right now. I say, I choose, right? We could, like I mentioned earlier, it's really a choice of intention. The stronger habit might be to say, no, I don't like how the body feels. <clears throat> I wanna fix it, I want it to be different than it is. But it is possible, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if we experiment and, you know, don't get confused by maybe the stronger habit in the mind, isn't it possible to find the intention now to say yes to how the body is feeling? Yes, it is this way now. Can this be okay? Can I accept, can I allow, can I be forgiving with the way the body is? And this brings us, as we're settling into our guided loving kindness practice, I'm just reviewing some of the real foundational teachings about metta or loving kindness practice. And it all centers on this term in early Buddhism that gets translated as boundless, boundlessness or immeasurable. But when we switch intentions from, you know, the intention to be averse, to be irritated, to be controlling, to intention to be saying yes and allowing and opening, forgiving, feeling, you see, that's in that direction of expansion. And that really goes to the heart of understanding how to find and trust. And ultimately, we're just going to abide. We're going to be the loving kindness instead of, you know, practicing loving kindness. We're going to rest in that boundless, generous, trustworthy, inclusive quality that is available, but because we're spellbound by our habits of, our, our aversive habits, controlling habits, judging habits, we tend to forget about this other option, which is the intention of love or metta and compassion and appreciation and equanimity. The Buddha taught, this is a slightly different translation of that chant we do a lot at Common Ground, the suffusion with the divine abidings. Sometimes we just call it the four quarters chant. I will abide pervading all quarters what's in front, what's to the right, what's behind, to the left, above and below, with a heart imbued with loving kindness. And in the same way, all directions, above, below, completely everywhere, being without mental shackles, resentment, ill will, or contention, with a heart imbued with metta, loving kindness, that is supremely vast and great, boundless and well-developed. One dwells having pervaded the entire world. And it's such a cause for trusting our heart. So you can feel free to close your eyes if you haven't already, sitting comfortably as best you can. And we take advantage of our vast memories and just bring to mind a situation, a person, a being that naturally, organically evokes this generous quality of love. For me, it might be just 
remembering myself holding our cat close to my heart, feeling the warmth of his body up against my chest, both of us looking out a window in our house, just having a moment together where he's content to be held and I'm content to be holding. And just for me, a, a situation like that, the purity of that generous, simple kindness is very trustworthy. It's not polluted by my neediness. If you wanted to get down, I'd let him go down. Just a shared moment of love. And I really trust that quality of giving, giving my good wishes. Because in those moments, the only or the predominant quality in the heart is may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease in your life, free from suffering. And that generous wish, in this case for my cat, our cat, it just comes naturally. It's not something contrived or forced, or oh, I should feel this way. So I just invite you to see what memory, what mental image might come to mind for you. And just let, you know, you might try a couple, but just let whatever one you decide on, let that be good enough. Don't look for the perfect memory or mental image. Might be just a casual interaction with someone on the street or a neighbor that you don't even know well, but it just felt really, the kindness felt very authentic and uncontrived. And then learn to hold and even rest with that mental image, that memory, and tune into the felt sense, that generosity of the heart that gives, gives that simple wish, natural, organic wish. May you be at ease. May you be happy and at ease in your life. May you take care of yourself with ease. I do care about you and I wish you well. So you can try some phrases silently, of course, in your mind, just offering whatever being you're bringing to mind, your love in the most simple, natural way. And we use the phrases and the mental image until we have a more clear sense of the upwelling of kindness in the heart. It's that felt sense, that upwelling of that goodness that then can become the meditation object. And when it's not needed anymore, then you can even drop the mental image, you can drop the phrases and just stay attuned to the upwelling of love outward toward that being, but really outward in all directions. Eventually you even sense that expansive, boundless benevolence of the heart. It's really the essence of metta or spiritual love or whatever you want to call it. And then the final step is to learn to really trust and abide and rest in a way we're just being love instead of trying to practice love. Trusting that expansive, generous goodness in all directions. 
But when you need the specific mental image and the phrases, then go back. See who comes to mind. Feel the natural upwelling toward that person, that being. Use the phrases when they're helpful. But then drop them when the upwelling, the goodness itself is clear enough. So let's continue now for a while in silence.
you can think about the practice as four steps. When you need to, doing whatever works to arouse the quality of love with memory, with a reflection or some phrase that you repeat. And then when you feel the welling up of love in the heart, that movement of the heart, then let that be the practice to keep that welling up, that movement of love in mind as your meditation object. And then when that is stronger, then we're really practicing this boundlessness or this radiation that this quality of love that may be originated because we brought a particular person or being to mind really is inclusive, willing to go out in all directions, not holding back, nobody left out. And the last step is to learn to really rest and abide and trust this boundless goodness of the heart. So not so much doing the practice as much as just being love, resting in love.
course, the quality of boundlessness, this generosity of the heart, goodness of the heart is subtle. So it's a particular skill to keep it in mind, to trust its goodness, and to learn not to be distracted by more gross emotions that will, of course, come and go, including doubt, am I doing it right? More than anything, loving kindness practice depends on learning how to keep this boundless quality of love, of goodness, how to keep it in mind, not to forget moment by moment. And when you need a phrase or a word to support that, keeping it in mind, then of course use a mental image, a word or a phrase. Including the Buddha's own words, there's a slightly different translation, the one we usually chant in the mornings. I will abide pervading all quarters with this heart imbued with kindness above and below, all around and everywhere, every way I will abide, including to myself, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, free from hostility and ill will, I will abide in kindness.
abiding in loving kindness can be a trustworthy pleasure. So for the last minute or so, just see if you can directly sense, feel into the pleasure, the inner pleasure of being connected with love, the attitude of kindness, the generosity of the heart. And it's really okay to learn how to be nourished in a spiritual, emotional sense by this good feeling of love. And we can begin to heal the wounds of hate and fear and all the ways we close our heart. Take a little time and adjust. It's <clears throat> even okay if you wanna stand for a moment to move the body a little bit. So you'd be comfortable settling in. And if you came in late, um, I'm here at Common Grounds Retreat Property in Prairie Farm, Wisconsin, about 83 miles to the east of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, we've been in the middle of a work retreat, getting the place ready to reopen later in the month of June. And so it's really nice to be here teaching. I'm assuming you can hear me okay. And Internet seems to be working well enough, which is good. Yeah, and uh, those of you who haven't been part of the Friday evening loving kindness practice group that we've been doing every Friday, I think as we transition, we'll probably go back to maybe just having it on the first Friday of the month that I'll lead. And I think Stacy McClendon will probably continue on the fourth Friday of the month. And Jane and Jean, who have been doing the self-compassion practice on the third Friday of the month will continue as well. That's the plan and continue doing it online. Although we might at some point make it a hybrid program like tonight, there are a few people in the room with me. <clears throat> um, and we might start doing that for those of you who live in the cities to come to the center, but we're not sure when that will happen. But we have this time now at least a half an hour, we can take a little bit more too. Just, I often say that, you know, as human beings, we're learning a lot about these wholesome attitudes, the divine abodes, as we call them, in early Buddhism, of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy and equanimity, right? We're naturally learning a lot, and like it or not, we're learning a lot about the opposite, right? Cruelty as opposed to compassion or <clears throat> envy instead of appreciative joy, reactivity instead of equanimity and ill will instead of kindness. I mean, it's just amazing how just, if we just take a moment and reflect today, I mean, they might've been little moments, but how many moments there were when the heart was colored and maybe even dominated by ill will or by envy or um, reactivity or hatred, whatever it might have been. 
And of course, to hate ourselves because we're human and we have those opposites of the divine abodes, you know, and we're capable of being irritable or whatever, grumpy. That doesn't help to judge ourselves or to somehow get tight about the conditioning. As one of my teachers says, you know, the, the way our mind is conditioned, it's really impersonal and it's our responsibility. And somehow our practice needs to hold both of that. Because otherwise we can turn the loving kindness practices that we do, like the one we did tonight, we can turn it into a sort of a version of hating ourselves or judging ourselves. You know, we try to be loving, it doesn't work. We start having doubt. We just feel like my heart is completely irredeemable. You know, it's just there's so much negativity, so much aversion, so much self-loathing, why bother? And, and it even can seem, I'm sure some of you have felt this, that, you know what? People say this to teachers, you know what? The time I notice the most self-hatred is when I try to do loving kindness practice. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, we need a sense of humor about that. And I think the, the real key is to that first step of how we might arouse kindness, how we can actually um, take advantage of our lived past and the memories, the felt sense, and the possibilities of intentions. This is so important because, you know, in any moment, there's going to be a particular motivation or intention in the mind, volition in the mind. And we habitually think that whatever intention I have now, like if I'm grumpy, and my intention is like to blame whatever I think is to blame for my irritation. The tendency is to just imagine that that intention is me. So, and therefore, because it's me, there's no reason to question it at all. So we don't look. But what practice delivers over time is that there are many, like in any moment of our life, there are many possible intentions for the mind to keep in mind. And the loudest intention, the biggest intention is just one of the many intentions. So you might say something to me or do something that triggers an unwholesome reaction. So I have some ill will. And that's a big movement in my heart, a big intention, like maybe I wanna get even and do a zinger toward you because you've irritated me and I'm gonna put you in your place or something like that, whatever it might be, or maybe you're more the type to close down and to sort of get involved in self-hatred. But with practice, we see that, we feel, we, we feel what that feels like in the body and we know it's just the way it is, right? And it's just one possible intention. And it, it's almost as if the mind is just curious, well, what other intentions are available? That's the loudest, that's the biggest, that's the one with most momentum. What other intentions might be possible right now? And there may be a, an intention like, oh honey, it isn't easy being a human being. That may be a quieter motive force in the heart, but we might, like if we're not immediately swept away by the big intention to be full of ill will and wanting to get even, we might notice the other intention or we might see that intention to recognize that, that other person, they're also a human being. And like me, it's not easy being a human being. And they're probably acting out whatever pain they're experiencing or whatever you know, limited perspective that they're living out of. Ah, right? And the heart starts to expand. That generosity like, oh, it's hard being a human being. And I care, I care about, maybe initially we just care about ourselves, but it won't be long before that upwelling, we make the shift from the second step, right? The first step is just how can we arouse this human potential to be kind, to be loving, to be that, that sort of giving away our good wishes toward ourselves or others. How can we arouse it? 
And how, once aroused, how can we feel, have that felt sense of up, uh, upwelling? And it's really an upwelling of goodness, and it feels good, because it's the opposite of a narrow, tight frame of mind. It's a generous quality of heart and mind, and it's a loosening of the oppressiveness of fear and hatred and envy and you know, the, the opposites of the four divine abodes, so that we recognize that upwelling. And then the next, the third step is that upwelling, we tune into a very particular quality of it, which is, it isn't dependent. So initially, like I, the example I gave about holding my cat next to my heart and looking out the window and having those shared moments where we're both happy to be with each other, you know, and it may only be 20 seconds before, he's, he's not a cat that likes to be held. And I'm not a person who likes to hold a cat. So it kind of works because like 20 seconds is sort of enough. And we're both really relaxed for about 20 seconds before my sort of restless nature is going, okay, so what's next? And his restless nature is going, yeah, that's enough. It's time for me to go outside or do this or that. So we have that moment and we can feel the upwelling and then to notice that that good, that upwelling of goodness isn't actually just about the cat. It's not dependent on the cat. Having the cat there or just even the memory of the cat being there, or, you know, whoever you're, however you're able to arouse love for yourself, right? And then we feel the actual capacity to care. That's the upwelling. And then the third is realizing that that upwelling actually isn't dependent on what we use to arouse it. That's an important step. And a lot of us in our meditation, our loving kindness meditation, we just stick with having a cause for the love we're keeping in mind. But we really want to begin to realize love, whatever the flavor, compassion, kindness, joy, equanimity, any of the four flavors of love, we want to realize it not dependent, independent. And that's the beginning, like understanding that boundless quality. Like this is a, a natural resting place for the heart and mind to be generously open, to not be throwing anything out or to not be inclusive of everything. And, and that, you know, the image is like a light that shines in all directions. That's why the four quarters, behind, to the left, above, below, everywhere and every way, including to ourselves, nothing is left out. It's boundless, unrestricted. And so that's the third step, is just to basically begin to sense that generosity of light that just goes out in all directions. It's not picking and choosing. And this is like a felt sense in the heart, that generosity. And then the fourth step is to trust that enough to relax, to really, to, it's another insight, right? The realization that I don't have to do it. Because we're still in that mode like, oh yeah, I'm radiating out infinitely in all directions. It's really a good thing. It's probably a lot of healing going on around. This is great. And there's still an identification with the radiation that the great generosity of love in all directions. And then we realize even that's too much. We, it's unnecessary. So we drop the doing and it's more like resting, abiding. And it's a whole nother little subtle learning. So we have the arousing, the actual felt sense of love moving in our heart, body, and mind, the upwelling, going from a constricted state to like a flower blossoming, or a, a kind of, you know, someone can have sort of a, not a frown even, but just a, a lack of affect. And then something makes them happy and it's like, that natural smile just blossoms. So that's the upwelling, that's the second insight. Like, oh yeah, this heart is capable of blossoming in a very organic, natural way with love. 
cool, it's beautiful. And then the third is to see that that love isn't dependent on anything. Does it need a cause? Even though we used an image or a phrase or whatever we used to kind of ignite it. So it's boundless. It has its own sort of feedback. The good feeling itself feeds back and it just builds like an exponential function if you know math. It just sort of expands. And then the last is trusting, relaxing, abiding, going from doing to being. And I really appreciate Venerable Analio, this German monk who kind of just clarified these four steps because I find them very useful and hopefully you will too. Yeah, but part of that is just the habit of the mind to turn towards suffering. And some of us have the habit of the mind to turn away from suffering. And some of us have the habit of mind to turn towards suffering. So it's good to know how to turn towards suffering and to allow the heart to be touched. But if it's too much too soon, then we're not good for anybody because it's like a big wave comes and we don't even know how to handle that emotional wave, let alone be useful for other people that might or to model fearlessness in the world, right? So part of it is, it's like when the mind notices that suffering, you don't wanna tell yourself that you're doing something wrong because what you're, what's coming to your mind may be very, you might be very clear, right? Seeing clearly the way it is, but is it the only truth? And so a simple question, Joan, like, well, what else is true? Oh, there's, there's a bunny rabbit in my backyard eating the clover. That's also true right now. And I'm, I can imagine without too much of a stretch that that rabbit is happy that there's green clover to chew on, you know, and is right now not being threatened. And I, and I feel a natural welling up, may you be well. May you live with ease. I know there's a lot of suffering and I know there are a lot of cats hunting rabbits and you know, let alone whatever else, right? But I care and that feels good. Or just, you know, appreciate the chair you're sitting on or the health that you have in this moment. So it doesn't, it isn't about denying the truth of suffering in the world. It's also being curious, like when, when we're not curious about what else is true, our recognition of suffering could have possibly drifted not into compassion, but into a version of, oh, poor me, the world is totally screwed up and it's totally unfair and people are being completely oppressed, unfairly taken advantage of and I don't know what to do, and it's not okay. And, and basically we're justifying getting tight because we're activating fear. And it's not that we're not seeing clearly, we're just not taking in the whole picture. The 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. And it's so interesting, you know, how when we uh, make become intentional about seeing the joys as simple ordinary joys it can feel this is a lie but it can feel like we're not doing justice to the truth of suffering because we're enjoying a milkshake or a warm bath or laughing about a stupid program with a friend you know it's like how can we do that when people are being oppressed or taken advantage of or whatever and that's just, we, we, we need to ask yourself, well, what's the, how does it cause harm? I mean, you, you could say the same thing about meditation. How can we put aside 30 minutes or 45 minutes to abide in that good feeling of universal love when we should be, and on and on, right? And this is the, this is the thing, it's like, um, We have to open to the possibility that, uh, like that, the, the idea that I have to suffer until everybody's free from suffering 
that that's sort of a, the spiritual ideal as opposed to I'm going to do my best to learn how to live freely in a world filled with suffering so as to model for everybody else how to learn how to be free in a world that's filled with suffering and injustice. doesn't mean we don't care about addressing the injustice or the suffering, but we're not imagining that postponing freedom is the way. But I don't claim to be good at this, <laughs> but I do claim to be interested in this. Just to look, because, you know, words are funny, and there may be like, if we take this inspiration to just observe when there's hope, when there's what we would call hope in our mind, in our heart, and when is it conducive of stress, and when is it conducive of love and, and freedom? That would be the useful thing. Because, you know, part of the teachings from the Buddha is that anything can happen anytime. And that we're, you know, unless you're like fully psychic and you feel and see everything, I don't know anybody like that. Um, like we're not able to read what's in motion. And so, you know, we might have some statistics from the veterinarian uh, or from a doctor or whatever, the particular thing we're wondering about, or even social situations, climate change, racial injustice, you know, should we be hopeful? Well, we know that anything's possible. We've seen like in history, things really turn around at times when they didn't think they were. And we've also seen at times things turn really go south really badly when maybe they weren't expected to go badly. So what is it like to live in that kind of world? So I would say hope, like even the truth of impermanence means that things are gonna keep changing. And so that keeps hope alive because I don't know how they're gonna change, but nothing's static. And the other thing that brings like from a early Buddhist point of view, hope in, hope comes with the deepening understanding of karma because there's a lot of emotion from the past, right? But how we're showing up, how we're relating right now is also a very, has a very powerful impact on how things are gonna unfold going forward. And it's like somebody gets cancer and they relate in this way. Another person gets cancer and they relate in a di completely different way and they have different outcomes. So we, part of hope is that it re, it's not set in stone. It really matters how I relate. Even if the circumstances are very dire, even if statistically it doesn't look good, it still matters how I relate, how I show up. Because that's part of what affects how things unfold. The mind that's knowing, the mind that's relating, the heart that's either here intimate or closed off, walled off. It matters. And then the last thing I'll say is the uh, early Buddhism is very pragmatic. So one way to address that question of hope is, uh, pragmatically speaking, is being hopeful. What does that set in motion in my heart and around me? Just ask that question in a very pragmatic way. It's not like, should I have hope? Is Rather, is it a pragmatically skillful thing to do, being hopeful? If not, let it go. If yes, then use it, right? And, and keep an open mind like, yeah, it was, seems like it was helpful, but now that I feel into it more, I see that it's not helpful or it seemed unhelpful, but now it seems like it buoys the heart up. So I'm gonna use it. So it's almost like a kind of medicine that we use strategically. Now people, we don't like to hear that we want a yes or no answer about these things, but early Buddhism is much more pragmatic. And like what's skillful, the medicine that's skillful, the way, the attitude that's skillful is really about this particular moment. And that's why we can't practice with a set plan. We have to be sensitive or intimate moment by moment so we can feel our way through our lives. 
And I loved what you said. First, I just want to say I loved what you said because that story about the ants, a perfect example of what Junie and I, I think we're chatting about, like there are different ways to tell the story about the ant carrying the other ant. And then just pragmatically asking ourselves, I mean, not that we have to get that involved, but how do I want to tell the story? Now that I'm seeing an ant carrying another ant, it's not done because there's not just one way to tell the story. What's a skillful, what's an enlivening way for my mind to understand what I'm seeing on the sidewalk? And that's, again, we don't like that because it's like, it feels like a lot more responsibility. Not only are we living our life, but we have to decide what's the right way to narrate our life to ourselves. But if we don't, we're gonna narrate our life to ourselves in the way that is the biggest habit, which is often kind of a fear-based way or, you know, but generally not that skillful. So it's really good to realize there's always a choice in terms of our intention, in terms of how we tell the story. And, and the neat thing is we could tell the story. It sounds like you did that with the ant, like, you know, oh no, you know, that ant's dead or whatever. And then you realize, I don't know, it'd be interesting even to, to deconstruct like how you realize, oh, there's another way to tell the story a more satisfying way, a more useful way, a more enlivening way. Same is true with the difficult people in our lives. Like we can lament and feel, oh, poor me about those uh, petty tyrants, you know, the difficult people in our lives. And we all have our version of that or many of those versions of those people in our lives. And, uh, you know, I know it sounds a little contrived to say it, but like, oh, goody, I'm going to work and I'm going to have to meet with that person. And boy, did they know how to get under my skin or bo boy, did they trigger that unhelpful response, uh, response in me to be defensive or to feel really bad about myself. This will be interesting. You know, it's like, how, what, I wonder what freedom looks like when I have a working colleague, colleague like this. And just to imagine that, yeah, it, you, it may not be something that we would choose to have a colleague like this, but given that we have a colleague like this, what's the best way, most functional way to frame having a colleague like this? Like God is out to get me, or this isn't fair, or this person has no right to exist. I mean, these, because any of those ideas and sort of frames are oppressive, you know, believing that somehow nature should not allow those kind of people because just all the implications of that point of view. So, and then there are of course many other things to keep in mind when we have a difficult person. One is, is to often an easy, a relatively easy step is to realize working with a person like this is really hard. And it reminds me it's not easy being a human being. This is a prime example of what I mean when I tell myself it isn't easy being a human being. And it breaks my heart. Because if it's like this for me, it's like this for everybody in little and big ways. And I care about my own discomfort having to work with this person. And in my better moments, I care about everybody else having to deal with their petty tyrants. And, and all of a sudden we're in a good place because not because we don't have a difficult person, but because we care about having a difficult person. So one is identifying with the victim of this, what we imagine is an obnoxious person. But the other is this generous, oh, honey, you're in a pickle. This person isn't going to leave probably. And I care about that. Like I, I'm, I'm in this perspective where I can be generously caring about my own life as opposed to being the victim of my life. And it's really just a shift in intention. Do I want to dwell as the victim or do I want to abide as the one who cares about how difficult it is? And then when there's more stability, we don't feel so 
oppressed by the difficult person, then we can realize how difficult it must be to be that difficult person. So that we, we train ourselves to see the other person, the difficult person, through the lens that recognizes the truth of suffering and them. Like, I wonder what it would be like to be having the attitudes that this person has, as, I, as the best I can tell. I wonder what it would be like to be making the choices that this person is making. I wonder what that would be like to be in their skin. Oh, probably not so good. Even if they would say to me that they're doing fine, I'm guessing it's not so fine, even if they don't realize it themselves, right? Because if the person is really being unskillful, then karma does the work. It is not comfortable being unskillful. No one gets away with nothing. That was one of my teachers, Ruth Dennison, uh, who I studied with a little bit. Um, she's dead now, but she's just a real character and wonderful Dharma teacher. And she says, honey, you don't get away with nothing. <laughs> And that's the, that's the thing. So if we're in a, you know, causing trouble in the world, you know, and even if we're a beautiful, we have a beautiful body and a lot of wealth and a lot of power, no one gets away with anything because that negativity leaves an imprint. It doesn't matter if no one else notices that someone's being unskillful even because it, the heart itself knows if it's abiding in hatred or fear or whatever. Such a powerful example. Um, and like in that moment, just to realize, uh, like giving, just like you, the last point you were making, Jillian, about creating, like realizing there's space for the chaos of having a three year old, right? I don't have to manage or control it. And, uh, but even our own obsessive controlling. Can there be space for that too? You know, that's the moment of forgiveness because you could have beaten yourself up, right? But something else happened. You didn't bother to beat yourself up for being, having the claws in, as you said, right? You just were so grateful that the claws could really, like realizing that the claws don't have to be there. And that's, you know, that's really, and probably I don't have, I didn't raise kids, I don't have kids, but just all the different places there is that chaos. For some of us who like now I'm in my mid sixties, just the chaos of having an aging body or those of us with busy jobs and lots of responsibilities, just the chaos of not being able to do everything with as much attention as we'd like that needs attention. Um, so there's, everyone has these places where things are too much, too fast, too chaotic. And like Jillian was saying, the claws come out. Like we just presume that being tight is justified, but it doesn't work. And then we harm the ones we love. We see that, you know, or we get in, our, in the way of taking care of what we want to take care of. And if we're lucky, we realize that, and I, I wrote this down uh, for these notes for tonight, life is either a tenderizing process or it's a solidifying process. These are our only two choices. And, and it reminds me of that quote from, I'm sure many of you have seen it, Helen Keller, um, who I am guessing most of you know was blind and deaf and for a while mute. She couldn't speak until her teacher, Ann Sullivan taught her how to talk and uh, said later in life, security is mostly a superstition it does not exist in nature. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. <laughs> That's probably something you can relate to as a mother of a three-year-old. Yeah, so nice to be with everyone tonight. Yeah, and the, and the reason why it's helpful to have these four is we tend to like just stick with often the first one, arousing love, but it's already aroused. And if we don't go on to the others, the more refined steps, the practice will get frustrating. So we wanna arouse it. And that's really the place of creativity where we kind of use our memories 
and our um, mental images we can generate and language, words, ways we reflect. It could be a simple word, almost like a mantra, like the word ease. I use sometimes just repeating that reminds me like to feel that upwelling, that generosity of wishing beings ease, wishing myself ease. So the arousing and then paying attention, keeping in mind the upwelling. So now we're actually feeling the movement of love. It's a felt sense. There's something moving, expanding. We feel it from tightness to opening. And then the third is more refined, uh, you know, each one more refined. So the third step is when we realize that that movement that we've been feeling <coughs> and keep it in mind, it's naturally inclusive. It's not about the image that I brought to mind, that particular being or the particular situation that's evoking love. That love is here. It's always in a sense available and it's not dependent on anything. So now this is that um, boundlessness of love, the inclusivity of love. So it's, we're basically having insight into a more refined aspect of the attitude of love. And then the last is that we can abandon any idea of somebody meditating or practicing love. And it's, so it's much more about resting, trusting, abiding, because that really sets it free. Experimenting with not doing the meditation. <laughs> and there it, there it is, it's just love. Nobody doing it. So it's been wonderful to be together with everyone. May we all abide pervading love in all quarters, above and below, all around, everywhere and every way. Let's all abide pervading the all-encompassing world with love, abundant, boundless, immeasurable, freely given, without ill will, without hostility, May we all abide. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks for coming.